Last winter something astonishing, something extraordinary happened to me in this forest. This documentary examines the greater questions surrounding what happened. All of the characters in this story are real. Here we are in the Bailing Up Forest, with conditions ideal for fungus growth. For the, this is the time of the year for mushrooms and toadstools. The, the trees, the grass, the dampness, everything is right for them to fruit. And amongst these uh, little toadstools on the ground are to be found the little brown mushroom, the most famous of which are the psilocybe mushrooms or magic mushrooms. And this is the reason why at this time you'll see furtive figures in the background searching for these little treasures. I came to live in Bailing up about 10 years ago. As far as I know, there were no mushroom pickers then. They started about three or four years ago and the numbers have been building up steadily. Last year was a really bad year for lots of people. Each vehicle that stopped will be numbering it. There's provision at the rego, the sort of vehicle, uh, observation, time it was stopped. So I guess I'm grateful for their presence just because of the trespassing issues that are involved. As a matter of fact, I even called the police and thanked them this week. Where will you be, Barry? You I'll be here. Back here. Back here. So you want the vehicles brought back here? Back here. I ran the side. Back here. Right. The three cars that are up there now is a white ute, a little white. mustard yellow station, station wagon. Even the alternatives in this community were banding together to try and sort of stomp it down a little bit. You know? And we were, um, a few people were actually helping the police, taking number plates. In 8A something or other, something or other, those three there, so whoever goes and sits there now is going to have to be aware of those coming through until we get communications to right. We'll grab, a, grab the keys to the silver car and you can go in, you can go in and do what you have to do now. Right, and then... Uh, yeah, see Peter first. Having broken the rule, this sort of great divide of being a, a non-drug user into being a drug user, what then happens is that you sort of throw away a lot of the, the messages, the health messages, and you actually become more deviant in many ways because you've learned that you can break this law, the world doesn't crash in around your feet, so therefore you, carry, you tend to go on and do and break other and transgress other rules as well. If Mick lets us know... One so of he'll, us, he'll let us know when they're coming One of us can creep down. Yeah. Creep down this road here. Well, we'll grab the first one. Yep. As soon as you get back there, he can move in here and take over the second car here. Yeah, just tell him that uh, there's a little bit of movement going on, mate, it's to stand by. It's what the police are doing is having a good day out and enjoying the fact that they're enforcing the law. 
this is done in a discriminatory manner because when you look at the convictions for possession of magic mushrooms, if you're driving a Mercedes, you don't get your um, dashboard searched or you don't get your boot searched. If you're driving an old Holden or an old Kingswood, you certainly will. So the police enforce this law in a highly arbitrary fashion and we know that the sort of person that's likely to be busted for uh, any drug offence is likely to be predominantly male, working class, unemployed and uh, who are the traditional enemies uh, of the police force. The active drug found in magic mushrooms is psilocin or psilocybin. These chemicals are very similar in their structure to uh, LSD. They act on the central part of the brain, on the brain stem and the cerebral cortex. In those parts of the brain there are receptors and these receptors uh, have the drug act on them and they're, and they're stimulated. The normal chemicals which uh, act on the uh, receptors are, is 5-HT or serotonin, but psilocybin or psilocin can act on these receptors, stimulate them and produce the hallucinogenic effect. Pursuant to the Misuse of Drugs Act, it is an offence, a criminal offence, to possess um, psilocybin or to have anything with psilocybin in it in your possession. Um, if you are convicted of the offence of having a substance with psilocybin in it in your possession, you will be dealt with in a court of petty sessions before a magistrate and under the provisions of the Misuse of Drugs Act, um, penalties are provided of a fine of $2,000 or two years imprisonment or both. In fact, I think these laws are a bit silly because uh, the fact that it's our choice whether we decide uh, to eat these cybers ourselves. I'd like to say day to my father <laughs> and uh, it's God's garden and I choose to eat it. And it was 150 bucks, most expensive mushroom I ever didn't eat. Let's find one of these magic mushrooms and have a look at it to see what its characteristics are. Now there's a little group of them growing down here and we'll pick up couple of them and notice how very different the young and the old are. This is characteristic of mushrooms and toadstools. You can never really be safe just looking at one. Notice in the young one the peak to the dome of the cap and the white stem, a stem that in age or when you crush it uh, goes blue. You can see the colour change very clearly in this older specimen. Slimy on the cap, no ring and notice that the spore powder, which occurs on the gills, is a dark purplish black, rather the same as the spore powder on the common mushroom. No cup or any developmental swelling at the base. Those are the characteristics of this particular Psilocybe, Psilocybe subaeruginosa. <laughs> I think what um, I like most about magic mushrooms is the excitement of actually trying to find them. Yeah, yeah, especially um, the way we organised it those couple of times that we went, just um, parking the car in the next sort of property. Hiding it. Uh, I heard on the grapevine that they were um, paying some maps to direct them to this um, 
blue mushroom. Hiding the car, yeah. Um, just basically run, uh, make, waiting until no car's coming, then sort of sprinting across the road, over the fence and into the forest. In commando style. Yeah, and of course, for the first half an hour, you just you can't see them, your eyes just aren't tuned, are they? Yeah. Uh, they bring a joy all of their own. And perhaps even more anciently known is the use of the famous fly agaric that everybody knows, the red mushroom with the white spots on it. The fly agaric is supposed to have been the basis for the Norwegian warriors going berserk after they had become high on eating it. They became even more high if they drank the urine of people who had been eating the fly agaric because this concentrates and even enhances the effect. The reindeer are supposed to graze on the fly agaric and become wild afterwards. It plays a big part uh, in some of the shamanistic ceremonies of the Northern Hemisphere. In about 1500 BC there was a massive migration of Aryan people into the north of India and they brought with them the cult of Soma, Soma being the magic fly garrick mushroom. And then out of the cult of Soma arose the religion Hinduism. Right, now Hindus don't use magic mushrooms anymore but their ancient book Rig Veda contains well over a thousand hymns to Soma. There's even the theory that Christianity has its roots in a magic mushroom culture and it's based on fairly metaphorical interpretations of the Old and New Testament whereby the story of Jesus is in fact a euphemism for the fruiting body of the magic fly garrick mushroom. In other words, Jesus Christ is a mushroom. Well I reckon it's got to be more than just a coincidence that Red mushrooms with white spots have so often been used to illustrate children's books. Now perhaps the authors and illustrators of children's books have really been uh, drug fiends who have surreptitiously programmed us all from a very young age and that's why society is so dependent on drugs. And who can forget the unusual effect that eating a mushroom had on Alice? So I reckon the more you think about it, the more you realise that we all have historical, cultural and religious links with magic mushrooms. The reasons why I take mushrooms are sort of fairly related, fairly well related to the way I live. It's um, for the same reason people probably drink or smoke drugs or anything, it's just uh, some form of escape, not that I would take mushrooms every day after I had a hard day's work, not that I do. looking for wildflowers and we thought, oh gee whiz, look, it just turns green and all these people come out and look, they're all young people, isn't that nice? And <laughs> it took us a while to realise that they were looking for mushrooms. Well, one day we had a boy in here to buy something and he was just turned 16 and he said he'd come off a fishing boat and um, he said he would go and find the mushrooms out Jay's Road and that he would boil them and a blue fluid he would drink afterwards and he would see psychedelic colours. Oh, God. We jumped the road, jumped the fence again with all the goodies in hand and um, <laughs> Got back in the car, sort of took off, and one of us um, sat in the back, cross-legged in this sort of uh, sedan type. Uh, no, it was a wagon actually. Sorry, and um, had this little uh, primer stove and started bubbling away. I um, got some water and started um, boiling up these mushies as we were driving back on the road. The fresher and, the better. Yep, yeah, the fresher the better. So 
so we uh, we put we put in what we considered to be a, a good serving, which is about 15 for for three of us. Yeah. And um and um within 10 minutes um the the guy in the back was was serving us some serving us some mushroom tea, and um about 15 minutes later, as we were still driving, we started to just start the like it was like. I don't know. We were, we were on a shuttle, or we were just cruising Mission. up and through, up and down these roads. I actually thought that we were driving through the belly of a snake. Our main concern in relation to the mushrooms is the consumption of them. It is a hill. We've had in, uh, instances where people have um, had vehicle accidents. Driving was really good because you didn't have to concentrate on anything. It was like. If the road was good enough, it was like TV. Yeah. All you all you had to do was just watch and yeah, look, look, look at out. things. Mm. And every time every time a sign came up, like a sign saying "Give way," we'd we'd stop the car and look and go "Give way, <laughs> give way," and we'd spent ages working out what "give way" meant. <laughs> We've also heard of people being admitted to hospital, suffering uh, all sorts of pro um, health problems, and also mental problems. Types of people do go down there, and uh, it's just an influx, influx of people to the area. Some undesirable, and that's obviously of concern to the police. By their cars, a lot of them are quite well to do. There are a lot of Volvos and Porsches and Commodores, and <laughs> so they're not all young hippie type people. There are a lot of people with young children because in the rubbish there are disposable nappies. Magic Mushrooms users tend to be younger, they tend to be a bit more curious, they tend to be a bit more alternative in terms of having, you know, I want to explore myself. And for many people, the use of drugs, rather than being a sort of a deviant and depressing experience, it's actually a way of exploring and understanding themselves. I mean, you can understand yourself by travelling around the globe, but you can also understand yourself by travelling internally. One possibility is that uh, they come down and eat mushrooms down here because they can't afford to buy Southwest wine anymore. 16 to $20 a bottle, you're not going to get very many unemployed people being able to afford enough wine to get high. To get high. But you certainly can come down and pick some mushrooms for free and boil them up in a bit of river water and have yourself a nice drink for the cost of a tank of petrol. So are you suggesting that it's only unemployed people <laughs> who who come down here? I think that's leaping to a wild conclusion, isn't it? Well, I based that on my observation of cars, that people that drive old beat-up cars are more likely to be unemployed than those that spend $40,000 on well, look a... Look what I drive! I rest my case. Are you it's a bitchy ute. For some people, and one obviously has to look at the, the, the sort of the hippies of these, that was very much a culture which used LSD and hallucinogens uh, with great enthusiasm. And if kids today want to go out and get on drugs, I should reckon they should be allowed to. I think we've all learned that, you know, these drugs can be overused and that use can be damaging. But a lot of people still find that as part of their growing up, as part of their sort of exploration as a 17 to 25-year-old, uh, use and sort of the broadening of experience that hallucinogens gives can, can actually enhance their understanding of themselves. Uh, the great danger of attempting to collect the hallucinogenic mushrooms is the presence of little brown mushrooms that are actually deadly, the most famous of all being the gallerina. And here is one of those that I've just collected. This is gallerina autumnalis, one of the deadliest of the small brown mushrooms and one dangerously similar to the psilocybin. Notice the similarity of the colour of the cap. 
However, on turning it the other way up, you can see that the stem is uniformly brown, whereas it's a dirty white in the psilocybin. And the spore powder is a rust colour in the gallerina, whereas it's the purple-brown colour in the psilocybin. This actually contains the same poisons as occur in the deadly death cap of the Northern Hemisphere that is responsible for 95% of all deaths from fungus poisoning. Uh, the symptoms of this poison are that one perhaps feels a bit queasy, something that one might dismiss after eating a few mushrooms, and then the symptoms disappear, only to reappear uh, two or three days later in the most agonizing form while there's destruction of the liver and kidney. They are, in fact, extremely dangerous. It's extremely difficult to identify magic mushrooms, and because they're illegal, there's no information available to help you get it right. And even if you find a reference for a picture of one in a book in a library, I often find when you turn to the right page, the picture's been ripped out. So people choose their mushrooms by trial and error based on word of mouth descriptions, which can end in disaster considering there are deadly poisonous mushrooms out there. Leclerc, the deceiver. Strutheria. Gymnopolis Pampianus. Foliota. Swillus granulatus. Pycnoporus coccineus. Gallerina Nicena Pura uh, Here's evidence that people have been picking in the forest behind us concluded that they haven't got the psilocybe, because these are in fact foliotas, and then dumped the lot. Some people say that they should be illegal because they're dangerous. I'm not sure how dangerous they are. The only times I've had them, which is a few times, um, I've just been uh, well, there's been no harm done to myself or to anyone else because it's pretty hard to, to do much when you're basically just laughing the whole time. I didn't feel any sort of like yearning for them afterwards. It was like a good experience that sure I'd have it again but wouldn't want to do it straight away. The use of any psychoactive drug has risks. There's no such thing as absolute, uh, absolutely safe psychoactive drugs. In terms of its dependency uh, potential, the interesting thing about hallucinogenic drugs is that you seldom see someone having withdrawal symptoms from hallucinogens. And the reason for this is that most people quickly learn how to get the maximum effect from their hallucinogens, and they do that by titrating the dose down, not up. So you don't get escalation of dose, which is essential, really, I think for some sort of unmarked uh, dependence or withdrawal syndrome. So what you get, you get people knowing that the best way to have a good trip is to use it in moderate doses. So in fact, with hallucinogens, less is more. I remember being sick afterwards, but that was all gone in 15 minutes or so. <laughs> no, they're not dangerous. I think you might lose it for a while, but I don't think you'd actually die. 
uh, unless you were mentally unstable, of course, to start with, and then once again you could be in some trouble. But that's more a symptom of you than the drug, I think. All of us are on some dimension from being absolutely sane to crazy. And the interesting thing about hallucinogenic drugs is that for some people, and I suspect they're down this end of the dimension, the use of hallucinogenic drugs can trigger uh, a toxic psychosis or even uh, a psychosis in its own right, and that is madness. Uh, the best example of this is that in certain parts of uh, Glasgow, which in fact as you go to the outskirts of Glasgow in, in, in the autumn, you get a superb crop of magic mushrooms just growing up from Loch Lomond. And as somebody who worked in the local psychiatric hospital there, there was all Always, every year, as everyone flocked out to sort of score the magic mushrooms, there were always a few casualties from this in terms of very florid uh, psychiatric symptoms akin to schizophrenia. Now, do these drugs make people schizophrenic? No. What I think happens is that people who are beginning to find their thinking becoming a little disordered, who are getting a bit cosmic in their, their overall construing style, find these drugs very attractive and rush in and take too much. And in fact, what you can have with any drug like this is, is this sort of psychological crisis. Interestingly enough, what you can do, you can manage these things relatively effectively. So what you need to do is to have um, a period of, uh, of medication where you're people are tranquilized and calmed and reassured and many people will recover from those experiences without any permanent damage. vision started to to really sort of start going astray all my, everything in the room and all the people that were there started to sort of not quite float but sort of drip and melt all sort of Salvador Dali like you know dripping clocks physiologically I sort of like lost lost the feelings in my body and like I my hands no no longer could could uh, I couldn't feel anything that I was holding. I, was, I remember walking around the house and the, the floor was moving. It's like a, a bit like a magic carpet ride, really. It was just like roaming up and down the little, the little uh, turrets in the carpet and the carpet was coming at you and you were just like rocking with it. My hearing also started to uh, almost fracture. Separate sounds were split up. And so that what you were hearing, what people were saying you didn't hear until quite a quite a while after it actually been said and even when when I spoke myself it was hard to realize that I was actually speaking until a little bit later on walked into a few rooms and remember looking in a mirror and thinking whoa and all around me in a total 360 degrees were little creatures like just little creatures with little skeletons I'm um, just just going arr, 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 like talking and, and moving and gyrating and yeah we'll always um, hallucinate skulls or, or yeah, um, yeah. Th actually this this same trip um, um, I had this this creature in front of my eyes and every time I close my eyes this this creature would there, be there going arr! and it was there it was there for about four hours I guess wanting to experiment with any drugs is is this is escapism isn't it I mean if you're not happy with your lot or or you want to add an, an extra dimension to your life then you, you try something different and it de depends on how much of a risk take you are in that respect. But it's also a social thing I mean you know if you go to a party I mean people are not smoking marijuana to get high it's somehow like the old Indian passing the peace pipe it's a sort of solidarity and camaraderie of getting slightly mellowed out while doing something that's uh, illegal and, you know, we're all in this together, folks. Magic mushrooms are common on the east coast of Australia, but they've never been seen here in Western Australia until all of a sudden they start growing in this one tiny little patch no bigger than a football field. 
which is pretty bizarre. There are a lot of theories as to how the mushrooms have arrived in, in the area. Um, one theory that has been banded around that actually calm introduced the mushrooms in the pine forest area um, in order that this particular type of mushroom was um, to help break down the pine cones. Now I've got no idea personally how the, the mushrooms um, first started in the area. There has been, it has been rumoured that uh, an old hippie from many, many years gone by brought some back from overseas and, and planted them and they've just uh, taken off from there. Now one theory is that magic mushrooms actually arrive randomly on Earth and that they travel as spores on cosmic dust through space and that the hallucinations they provide are actually the messages of aliens from other worlds. I think we can dismiss the theory that they're actually of extraterrestrial origin. So how do they make their way to this corner of the woodland in bailing up? Another idea is that they might have blown across the Nullarbor Plain from South Australia, where it's known that they grow, by means of spores. But it's a very, very long way for spores to come to this one spot. The other suggestion is that people actually brought them here deliberately to start some sort of industry in hallucinogenic mushrooms. But one would have thought that they might have chosen the gold tops, a better known and more easily grown a magic mushroom than this particular species. Then there is the suggestion that they were actually introduced by conservation and land management. It's known that they've been working on fungi in association with pine trees, the so-called mycorrhizal association, but it seems very unlikely that they would introduce such a thing without proper notification, being an official body, and anyway, these particular species are not mycorrhizal. So I think we can dismiss this theory. It's this dung growing here, this cow dung, that perhaps gives us the clue, because cattle have been grazing in this woodland for a number of years, and the spores of fungi such as this can actually live in the gut of cattle and be <coughs> excreted and grow in the dung and then spread from that particular point. This would seem to be the best theory of how these particular mushrooms arrived in this particular place. But if you think about it, cattle have been transported all over Western Australia for decades, so why would they only suddenly appear now in this one little patch? Now I spoke to a mushroom picker that travels all around Australia from mushroom patch to mushroom patch to mushroom patch. And I think it's possible that someone like that could have introduced the mushrooms into the area. However, I admit that we probably will never know exactly how the mushrooms came to bailing up. A young eight or nine year old schoolboy who is a bailing up residence was offered a bag of mushrooms for sale by some young people that were obviously down here picking mushrooms and that really upset a lot of people. I, one night I was home on my own and I could see lights down over the brook and it took me a while to realise that that's probably what it was, you know, mushroom hunters but it's just, I, I guess in a small town like bailing up in the country you assume that you've got a level of security that you don't have in the city and it's just, I guess, threatens you a little bit to think that that's um, at risk. It appears that they, they left the scene and also left the fire going at the same time and it appears that this fire had spread to, uh, to the bridge itself and the bridge appeared to, uh, to be on fire. Uh, uh, well, my wife actually came past from coming home from work uh, one evening and noticed that the, that the bridge was actually on fire. Uh, she informed me of the, of the situation and I in turn uh, informed my um, fire control officer uh, who, uh, who uh, rendezvoused with me on, on site at the bridge and we subsequently put the fire out. 
The contacts I've had with them, they've been very nice people. There were two young boys there with guitars under the bridge, sheltering from the rain, and I had a really nice talk to them. I thought they were great. They do leave a lot of rubbish around, and that's my big gripe. Well, I worked for 10 years in the government office and I've worked for 25 years in this business and I believe that I've put a great deal of time and effort into my children and I believe that uh, I shouldn't be repaid uh, in this way by children taking this kind of trouble. I said, did you eat any of them? You replied, yeah. I said, how many? About half a dozen. What about your mates? Did they eat any? You replied, I don't know. I said, what did you intend to do with the ones you picked? And you replied, eat them. The media publicity that was generated from these operations obviously assisted us uh, greatly in bringing to the attention of the people that um, the problem with the mushrooms and also the fact that police would be there and uh, we'd do something about the matter. The interesting thing about publicity about drug use is that in many ways it's done in a rather naive view that if you warn people about drugs they won't do them. But in fact we know about media that at the end of the day it's not really what the media does to people, it's what people do with the media they hear. And for many people who don't do drugs, some shock horror about drugs or police arresting people will scare them away from doing what they wouldn't have done anyway. But for people who have an interest, that is in fact the, the, it's like the oxygen of publicity, which is encourages interest, spark interest, and actually will make them go off and experiment because they'll actually be informed that yes, there are drugs available and yes, they are interesting things to do. And I had this really full-on sort of butterfly feeling in my stomach. And it sort of almost moved through my body and became a real full-on cosmic sexual experience. And, you know, I hadn't had sex for half a year. That probably contributed to it and helped, <laughs> definitely, I'd say. And, I mean, it went on for like an hour or two. And it was just like making love to colours, making love to, you know, smells, sounds. And being at one with them almost was really, really spun out. And there was a person which was interested in at the time who was actually there. Or it felt like she was there, but she wasn't really there. And I'd love to actually speak to her and see what she felt. So it was a really full-on, full-on experience. I didn't actually ejaculate, so I didn't have a wank or anything. It was just, um, just a real full-on sexual wave that sort of went through, sort of on and off sort of thing. Uh, I'd love to try them again. It was almost a lot better. It's better than real sex, almost. It's just intense. I'd love to actually make love on them. It'd be a spun out experience, I think. It'd sort of swell up and then disappear again. You'd feel quite normal again. And then the next time, you'd breathe up again, a little stronger than the last time, and disappear again. Each time getting stronger and stronger until our roof turned into the ocean, <laughs> which <laughs> was a little hard to deal with, especially because it was upside down. I was in the process of becoming part mushroom, or so I thought, in that I was uh, very sedate, not moving a lot, and thinking about things which I suppose if a mushroom could think, it would think uh, was important. Uh, more, the natural things in life, um, I suppose humans in general tend to skate across the surface of the earth in vehicles such as cars like this one, whereas my thoughts when I was, thought I was part mushroom were so totally removed from most things humans think about. All I could think about was how, you know, how grass was or how trees were and uh, how they're sort of built, in, how they get life out of the earth, whereas we seem to to skate across the surface, ravaging things in the way. Um, so, but I wasn't thinking about that in any political way. It was just on a very simple level, which I suppose was because 
I was fairly hammered. One of the questions I think we should ask ourselves is why people need to take drugs, why, why they need to, their lives are so unfulfilled that they're really into all this sort of stuff. I don't really think that making it a criminal offence is the answer. I think it's more that we need to make people more fulfilled in their life. And I don't really think that magic mushrooms are any different from any other drug like alcohol or tobacco or coffee or tea probably, or even food and the things that we get addicted on. Well, I think the way the authorities are dealing with the magic mushroom problem is very traditional in a sense, in that you know, they make the drug illegal, then they arrest those who use it. Now, bailing up's a tiny town, it's isolated, it's never had a drug problem before, it's virginal in a sense to the whole world of drugs. So I think you can look at this situation as a kind of test model or a microcosm of the greater drug problems of the world, particularly as to whether making drugs illegal is the answer. Prohibition on any drug, in, including magic mushrooms, has interesting and often unforeseen consequences. The first is that it actually diffuses the drug through the community because everyone sells on to everybody else. It actually causes pyramid selling. It's a bit like Amway International gone berserk. And everybody knows where to get them from. They all score off their friends. They all sell on to one another. So, in fact, your child or whatever won't be sold drugs at the schoolyard gate by some deviant pusher in a dirty coat, but, in fact, by their best friend. Well, there's always the situation could arise where someone could go pick the wrong mushrooms, go off to a party, supply them around the place, and we could have uh, numerous people being ill, think they're taking magic mushrooms, when, in fact, they're taking something completely different. The most interesting thing about prohibition is that it, at the end of the day it has nothing to do with harm or the dangerousness of drugs. Prohibition, in fact, is really a conspiracy of first world countries against third world countries. What you have, you have the drugs of the first world, alcohol, tobacco, um, pharmaceutical products as legal things, where the drugs of the third world, coca, opium and cannabis are illegal. Now the interesting thing about magic mushrooms is that predominantly, originally, they were a third world product. And so what you have here is something which the majority of first world people don't use. And so the idea that the police are actually saving us from ourselves by the law, enforcing the law I think is absolutely wrong. If there's to be prosecution simply because people might damage themselves by collecting little brown mushrooms then should one perhaps should extend it to prosecute people for collecting any mushrooms because they might harm themselves by collecting poisonous mushrooms in mistake for those that are good to eat. By having prohibition, you actually make drugs more dangerous, and you can show that by adulterants. But in this case, in magic mushrooms, you can actually argue that people just don't get the right sort of information. I mean, if they were really concerned about people not damaging themselves with uh, magic mushrooms, what you wouldn't do is give them a, a criminal conviction. What you wouldn't do is, is have no information available to users about how to use well and wisely. And the interesting thing, that all drugs, no matter what, how bad or dangerous their reputation, can actually be used well and wisely, if people know what to do. So, in fact, prohibition and law enforcement actually stops people using drugs in the least damaging way possible. 
And uh, quite clearly there are rules and recipes for using any hallucinogen. One is that you do it when you're feeling in a good space, when you're in a good place, and when you're with good people. Because one of the problems with hallucinogens is there is always the risk that they're going to trigger psychological disaster. And one of, it's not just the drug itself, it's also the mood of the taker. And if you're feeling a bit anxious, if you think the police are breathing down your neck, if you're not with people you're, typically, uh, you know, you're terribly happy with, then that's more likely to make that trip a bad one. But if you're, if you're comfortable, if you're feeling serene, if you're feeling with good people, and usually it's quite useful to have somebody who's straight, who's not using alongside you to talk you down if things get a bit ratty around the edges. But however the magic mushrooms got here, there's no doubt that they're here to stay. Their spores are going to be distributed all over the southwest and they will become more and more common. There are bold mushroom pickers, but there are no old bold mushroom pickers. Anon. <laughs> <laughs> 